in. Not having a dad and all that stuff and being mis misled from the beginning and not really having a chance. So the misinformation, I was destined to end in prison. I was destined to end up on drugs. The difference between night and day, I remember being on that PWT school bus and used to dread going home. You know, have to take shortcuts and walk through alleys, you know, the domestic gang members, man, from jumping on me. Not having no father to, you know, to guide me, to protect me. I had a brother. And um, he, when it was time for me to learn, to take my, uh, my driver's test, he didn't, he didn't, he wasn't there to show me because he didn't care. And um, when I was, I think, 16, and I had to do my first uh, summer job, I didn't, I didn't get through it because I didn't have nobody there to show me. And I'm 53 years old, and I get to watch my nephew take his little brother from, um, from uh, graduating high school to community college. You know, I called my, I called my uh, nephew Chris and said, hey, Chris, what you said, man, I'm taking Isaiah to um, register to enroll in school. I said, were you there for his, uh, driver's, uh, his first uh, driving uh, thing at, at school? She said, yeah. I, I, I was, gave him some pointers and all that kind of stuff, but he had an instructor with him. I said, what about his first summer job? He said, yeah, I helped him fill out the application. And that's how I learned through dealing with my nephews. And I had an older brother, you know. Um, growing up, I was poor, black, and in real trouble. I know that from early on, just from my surroundings. I remember being bused. Oh, I'm sorry. I grew up in South Central Los Angeles. And I remember being one of the first people that were bused back in the days to the valley, uh, San Fernando Valley. I remember going to uh, Valerio Elementary School. That developed some friends. I had a Korean friend named uh, Chan Kim. I had an Ecuadorian friend, looked like John Travolta, with beautiful spirit, kindred spirit. And um, I had a, 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 a a, a, a black friend named Chris, uh, remind me of a teddy bear, just a big chubby dude, soft, just soft all over. And um, they asked me to spend the night at their house. I spent the night at my Korean friend's house and getting to the door, he said, okay, take your, I see all these shoes wind up. Take off your shoes, please. For, okay, no problem. And I remember just laying in that bedroom, in that soft bed wishing they could adopt me like they did in different strokes, top bridges. But for the life of me, he asked me a few times, hey, won't you let me come down, you know, and, and spend the night with you? I said, no, nah, not now, maybe next week, next week. But the real reason was being in his house and being in my house, he wouldn't, I didn't see no roaches, you know, looking at TV and you see him running up and down the wall or see a, a mouse run right in front of you and stop and, and do his thing like you're not there. I felt ashamed, I felt embarrassed, and I felt anger, you know, not having dad. And um, just for being, just for being, man, for being black, man, poor and in real trouble. I, I just couldn't fathom, man, the coming home, I remember, Taking Chris, I brought Chris down to spend a week, to spend one, to spend a week in Severn Sunny, my black friend from the valley in junior high. And I remember, as we got deep, I remember we're walking up to my, up the apartment building where I stayed in. And he looked, and I saw this look come over his face, and I said, I know I shouldn't have did this. Took him upstairs introduced him to my mom, brother, sister. And, um, you know, he was just like, wow. You know, he just couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe somebody was this poor. He didn't believe somebody could be this poor, this down and out, this out of luck. You know, and he, he put on a good cheer and everything. But after that, he didn't talk to me no more. Just like he just disappeared in the smoke. So when we graduated from junior high, that was it. I never saw him again. He never called. He never, he never kept in contact with me or nothing. He just, and I live with that every day. I felt the same way he did.
I had two cousins. I love both of them the same equally. One was good, one was bad. Um, one was, one could fight real good. And he, he had that, that persona, that, that look and that, you know, I want to be just like him as far as learning how to protect myself. Being raised in a, you know, a single parent household. And um, I had another cousin that was real athletic. And I want to be more like him because he was nicer to me than my other cousin. My, my other cousin, we used to go to the movies. Instead of peeing downtown, we would go to the tower and we would go to the alley and we would climb all the way up. Go to the top, go all the way and climb all the way down. And um, I'm talking about 15, 16 stories high, man. And I would be so scared to death because I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of heights. I'd just be looking right. What are these? What are those called? I forgot. The handrail. The handrails, okay. You're climbing the outside of the building. Uh-huh, climb the outside of the tower on Broadway. Mm -hmm. They have movies on Broadway. Um, 7th and Broadway and the tower and I forgot the other one. But that one we couldn't climb over because they didn't have no, um, no handrails in the back. But we had to get on top of the trash can. I remember it was six of us. And I'm looking up, I'm like, oh my God, I can't do it. For the life of me, I still, I, I won't, I won't get on top, I won't get on top of a car, a truck could. That's how afraid I am. But back then, because my cousin, I wanted to impress him, I did it. I remember one time I was climbing and peeing on myself at the same time, I was so scared. That's not embarrassing, that's just the truth. But I did it for him to show him. I was like, um, I was just, you know, just loyal, man, just loyal, just wanted to just, you know, just wanted to be anybody but me. You know, I was a mama's boy, skid around shadow. Um, I had a few friends growing up, but like I said, I always just wanted, I just wanted to be like everybody else. I always feel different. I've always dressed different. I remember, um, the ninth, I was 15. Punk rock had just came out. I was listening to the, the Sex Pistols and um, I went to Hollywood and I stayed gone for three days because I met these, I was in Hollywood walking down the street and walking down the side street and these guys were in a, in a um, by the side of this building. They say, hey, would you like something to drink? Would you like a beer? I said, sure. I said, okay. I said, what's that? It's just a club. Come on. Man, they took me in the club. I'm seeing all these people with the spike here and all that stuff. I go downstairs, I see four youngsters, 13, 14 years old. This is in 84. And all of a sudden my, my foot was, was tapping and my, and it's been on ever since. I've been listening to punk rock since 1984. And I still have a, a cold playlist that I listen to at the LA Fitness down the street. My point is, <clears throat> when I got down there, and, and I saw the spikes and it just, it just ripped, it, 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 um, it just did something to me. It just, it just, it just made me, you know, just took me somewhere I never thought I'd go. And um, I stayed gone four days. I didn't call home. We were in Hollywood. We bomb change. We drunk beer, marijuana, and we stayed in abandoned buildings. But I know I had to get home to go to school. But you know what? I came back with a mohawk. I got teased, I got bullied, but I didn't cut it until it was time to go to school. And that's the way I was growing up. I was just different. You know, when Michael Jackson came out, I had the little thing, I had to look at Jerry Curl, uh, Prince, same thing. The time, used to have the, 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 the uh, uh, Hank, you know, the, the button down shirts with the, the butt down pants, excuse me, the, um, the dockers and the penny loafers and stuff like that. And I remember I used to be a mod. Had the long trench coat with all the buttons. I had some 501 jeans and they had checkers on one side and checkers on the other with Mitch Mack, all star, Compass All Stars. You know, that was me. And I had all kinds of different hairdos. And, um, I remember my mom saying, you know what? She said, 
when I look back at you growing up, she said, man, you, everybody used to always, because you didn't look, you didn't look, you didn't look like stupid at it, you know, but they used to always compliment you on just being, you know, different than the rest of the neighborhood kids. She said, you got compliments, so I never, she never told me back then, but she said, in retrospect, said a lot of people was like, man, something special about Eric. I said, something special about him. And um, I just didn't believe it. You know, so um, all the information I was given by Milton, wrong information, how to lie, how to cheat, how to steal, uh, how to fight, rob, and all that kind of stuff. And my other cousin, strictly sports. And um, I remember my cousin graduating from, t from high school and going to um, college, and he was in he was in in in, in, uh, in town. So he would come and get me on the weekends, take me to the campus, and have me spend the night. And he would take me to all the drills. You know, I want to be just like him. He was a wide receiver, and he was going to be the first one in our family to go to college and make it in the pros. And I was going to follow in his footsteps. But what happened was. He didn't, um, he didn't, he dropped out of college after the second year. And he was telling me, he said, Eric, you know what? He said, man, I don't have nobody to talk to. There's granny, my mom, your mom. There's nobody in any area that's ever been in college. So they really don't know where I'm, what I'm feeling, what I'm going through. And I didn't know at the time either, but I'm glad he confided in me. I'm glad he told me that. It meant a lot to me that he chose me. To ex he didn't have nobody because nobody was at that level. But he, he gave it to me and I appreciate that. And I will always treasure that. He tried out for the NFL teams after he dropped out of college. And the last team I think he tried out for was the San Diego Chargers. And um, he didn't make it. So he felt like he let the family down. Because everybody was, you know, Thomas, he's going he's gonna to be the one. He's going to be the one that do it. You know, he's going to be the one, you know. And when he didn't, he um, made a decision to marry his high school sweetheart and move to Texas. This is right before the crack, the gangs and all that. I said, please take me, <laughs> please take me with you. He said, I can't, man. I said, but why all of a sudden? Why all of a sudden, why now, just off the blue, but why way to Texas? And uh, he said, just a decision he had to do. He just, said, he just said he just had to do it for him. But many years later when we talked, he told me why, because he felt like he let everybody down. And um, there he went. One day he was there, and I think about three days later, my cousin was gone. I love my cousin. I love my, I love, I love my cousin. <laughs> He said, you know what, Eric? He says, only one regret, man. I didn't invest in you. I should have invested in you when I didn't make it because you were better than me. And you weren't taught that you just had that natural ability. Man, I went through the school, you know, uh, Pop Warner and all that kind of stuff, junior high, high school. He said, you didn't, but you, you just had that raw ability. He said, that's my only regret. I didn't invest in you when I didn't make it instead of leaving. So when he left, here come crack, here come gangs. And um, just a man, just, it was just like, wow. I didn't do the gang thing. Mama's boy um, got jumped and all that kind of stuff. So coming from school, junior high leading to high school, you know, I'm going to, I'm being bused to the, to the valley. And um, the Valerio, Valerio Elementary School. Uh, Fulton Junior High School, Van Nuys High School. And I remember just leaving the neighborhood, going way out there and seeing the difference in the streets, how clean the houses and everything. And I remember being on it um, at Van Nuys and I would leave for lunch and go to this um, little, um, um, little um, um, sandwich shop when they had some video games in there. And I love Centipede, that's the only game I played up until I was 40 years old. Never played another game with Centipede. Love it. I remember in the neighborhood, I'd be at home and some kids say, hey, Eric, the guy, the, the store owner around the corner wants to see you. So I'll go around there. He says, hey, man, we found this guy from uh, uh, 
uh, four blocks away. He wants to play your centipede. And if you win, I'm gonna give you the two liter soda, the big bag of chips, and the candy board. You know what? There'll be about 20 kids in there watching me and this other guy from another area play me because I was always the first three on top of Centipede. It was my name. Always. And I always played at that store. And I remember stores just being packed with kids watching and I'd be dressed in sweat on the game for two hours. Playing this one, we're going back and forth. But two hours and we're just playing our hearts off. Just playing, sweating. And the shop owner loved it. And I'm like, and I didn't, I didn't even realize it then, you know, that the store was packed with kids. Watch. So I didn't do the, the game thing, because I was a mama's boy, scared of my own shadow. But I would experience with some drugs and alcohol. And I told myself, I, I'll never forget. I told myself, I think at 50, I'm gonna try everything at least once. Man, shouldn't have did that. Shouldn't have held on to that like a badge of honor. Because it turned out to, um, you know, just, just, here we go. Uh, marijuana, loved it. Alcohol, not too much to care about it. I just said the drinking when it was time to go to uh, clubs and stuff like that. Uh, I remember I used to go to USC. To the cap, uh, to the sorority houses, and uh, get something to drink before catch the bus from the neighborhood. One bus down the street, you know, over there by uh, USC, and uh, have the time of my life. And um, I remember couldn't go to the neighborhood parties with my friends because how dangerous it was in my own neighborhood, you know. So um, it just gave me the courage, man, just to to be okay with just me, because I never felt okay with me. I never felt like I belonged in the family. Never, I just didn't. I went through self-deception, self-hatred, couldn't stand being black. Because what was depicted on TV just wasn't the same reality that I was living. I'm looking at different strokes. I'm like, oh man, why couldn't I be Todd Bridges? Looking at good times. Love good times because it was always a struggle, but the difference between good times was uh, J, uh, James, uh, JJ had a father, and um, I didn't. I didn't. So when Thomas left, Milton stepped in. And um, my introduction to person, crack. Hmm. I said I tried everything once, and I would do anything for my family. Even though I knew some information was being shared with me was wrong, it didn't matter. I, I love my cousin. My, my, my family's not gonna hurt me to be the last ones to hurt me. And the two men that were left, when, Thomas, when my cousin left was um, my brother and my cousin. And I didn't, get, I didn't get what I needed to be able to, to stand on my own. You know, I didn't know anything but wrong. You know, and I was, I was just scared, man. I was a scary cat, you know. And the drugs and alcohol made me feel better, made me feel like I could, like I could be, you know. And um, I never became because it wasn't reality. So I was stuck in this, this mindset under the influence of whatever it was at the time, PCP. Crack cocaine, marijuana, always marijuana and beer. Um, shot heroin once. I remember the dude, I remember the guy said to me, don't, 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 don't tell your mother because she'll tell your grandma to get at my mom and I'll be up. Chits Creek, please, please, I'm gonna do this, but n never. And I said, okay, and I kept my word until now, but no names, but I never forget walking to the store and I felt like I was walking in slow motion with them on myself. We stopped at the light and all of a sudden I just, Vomited, I threw up, and I never touched it again after that. That was my one experience. Um, I smoked it. Um, by then, I was in, I think I had about 15 rehabs behind me. I was at this uh, Jewish program. It's two, two token blacks, me and this other brother.
So me and one of the brothers, he had a, <laughs> you know, we just, we just clicked. And um, he um, came to the house. Cause I did, I did, I was a week from six months graduation and disappeared. And, but I had his number. So he came by my house. We sat in his car and we talked, you know. He said, he put it on there and he showed me how to do it and I did it. And I got sick to the stomach, but not like I did off of the, um, the uh, introverted way. But sick nonetheless. And um, I remember being in that, in that program and how comfortable it was and how roomy. And I was asking these guys, I said, hey man, um, where you coming from? He says, mom, I'm down here from New York. My mom said, I'm from Jerusalem. I'm from Israel. What? Yeah, I came all the way from Israel. It's a Jewish program. Mm -hmm. I said, wow. How much you pay? Uh, they said about 30,000. I was on GR. I feel thankful. And just being around that and learning a few things and having somebody invest some time in me opened up my mind to what could be rather than just being stuck in this, this South Central kind of mentality, you know, this uh, rap only and, 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 and just what I thought I knew, you know, just my little, what I had as far as blinders. I didn't see nothing but my experience and being in the Jewish program opened up me to other people's experiences and how far they came from and how we all had something in common. You know, so, um, I remember being turned on the crack. First time I took a hit, loved it. Fell in love. Never will be the same. And I knew it, I knew in the depths of my soul that I was really headed for something and I knew it wasn't gonna be nothing good. And real fast, I became a thief, a liar, a cheat, and homeless within three years of being 15 years old to 18. I was homeless at 18 and I think I did 19 trips to prison from 18 to I'm 53 now to 50. My last one was uh, nine years with 80 for $2.50 of stuff out the 99 cent store because of my past history. I could have died, but it was a blessing in disguise. But back then, I was just having fun. I was just trying to escape my reality. I didn't want to be me. I didn't want to be in that family. I didn't want to be in the neighborhood. I want to be anybody else but me. So I took on different parts of, I took a part of my cousin Thomas, I took a part of Milton, Todd, and all these other people that I grew up that I, that I liked. And I was, I lost myself in the process. It took me to be 51 years old to finally see, register who was looking back at me in the mirror. To get to know that person. Who's just looking back at you? You know this person loves you, depends on you, and needs you to be there for him. Like you're loyal to others, you was loyal to the dope man. Because he's gonna give you something. Or he trusted you to, to stay in the house while he went somewhere. So you're loyal to him to a fault. You know, he gives some stuff, you go to prison and you do time for him. Why can't you do that for you? Why can't you be that loyal yourself? Because I was never looking in the mirror long enough to see who was looking back at me. Because I was always running, always trying to escape for me. I got dealt, a, you know, even though I got the wrong information from the beginning, I, I understand that because looking back in retrospect, it's what they were taught. So these, they were just giving me what they were taught, even though it was wrong, so they knew. So it was all I knew going, moving forward. And um, I got tired of going to prison. I think I had 10 trips in in about 15 programs by the time I was 30, 31, no, so I'm sorry, my bad, about 20, 26, 27. So, um, man, I took a chance, because I was, you know, from, from being in prison at 18, they had weights back then, so I'm, 
I'm real big and I'm real strong. I look like, um, they called me back then, they called me, um, who they call me back then when I was younger? They called me like, they said, man, you look like a superhero. You know, cause I'm just, and um, I, I did. You know, tall, dark, and handsome with muscles. So that was an extra something that I had, you know, my favorite moving forward. You know, and um, it was all about the outside. All about that. I couldn't see past what you saw. So how you feel determined how, how much value I placed on me. And um, the women that, um, you know, that I had, um, my relationships. You know, my worth was based on, you know, how well I made love to them, how I satisfied them. You know, how proud they were to be with me when we were out. You know, I couldn't just factor in just having, just having it for me, you know. But I always place it on somebody else's if they feel good, if they're happy, if they're sad, then I'm sad. Then my value for me goes down, my worth goes down if they get upset. You know, and when the relationship didn't work, back at my mom's house, back and doing the, thing all, doing the same thing all over again. So, um, after about five uh, failed relationships, about 15 uh, programs, and about nine trips to prison, to uh, 16 months, four years, nine months, seven months, violations. Um, Every time I come on, get in the gym. And I was in the gym, and the guy said, hey, excuse me, I'm like, can I talk to you? He says, uh, I wonder if you can train me. I said, sure. And uh, we, we started, I started training him. And he said, I'd like to take some pictures one day and submit them to a magazine, because I think you just might. And um, I said, sure. So I did, the, I did a couple, um, I did one where I was, had a chainsaw, cut off lumberjack shirt on the ladder with the bandana. Then the other one, the other photo sh uh, shoot I did, I was like a, a police officer with the cut off sleeves and everything. And about two months later, he calls me. You made the cover, man. I was so happy, I couldn't believe it. I did this for a man. What, me? You made the cover of a, of a real, um, Real good magazine, man. Uh, uh, wrote known, you know. He said there, uh, you know, a lot of people read it. And uh, I said, okay, what kind of magazine? Is it? Oh, it's a gay magazine. What? I'm not gay. It don't matter. You made it. Okay, I made it, and I was okay with that. And with that, we went by different uh, adult bookstores, and he said, see you. I said, That's you. So I get one from here, and I get one from this video store. And we go to different stores, and since the the profiteer know it's me that's on there, I get it for free. So I get two, three from this one, two from this one. And got home, look mom, oh wow. You made the, yes, yeah, an adult book though. But I was so happy, I passed them out in the neighborhood. I didn't, give, I didn't give a damn about somebody. It didn't matter to me. It didn't, shit, I, I was somebody. You know, I made my own way. I, I finally did something, you know, on my own that, um, that um, gang recognition, man. So I feel proud, I'm giving, it, it, it doesn't matter. And from there, um, I got approached about doing movies. How much are dope movies? I said, how much is it? And uh, he told me, I said, wait a minute. Let me, um, let me, let, okay, I tried that, I was like, so I did two straight movies. Got paid, I didn't pay nothing. It's supposed to be 250, nothing. Too many, too many men, so you just ran out of money. So, but I found out the guy was using us like that, so he wouldn't have to pay us. It was a ploy, you know, a gangbang movie. So it's like nine of us and, and, and two women. But the women getting, you know, good money. He said, no, you guys can get paid because this is just like an introduction into the business. You know, you guys are all new at this, so just want to get you comfortable. I'm, I'm, okay, I'm cool with that. But after the second time, I'm like, uh-uh, no more Game Bang movies. I need something. You know, I need something. Because I remember the first one, I did all four in succession, you know, and came all four times. And I remember being around these men when it was time to get naked, take your business. 
I never forget it was this little short kid, little short white kid. And I looked down at him. I said, hey, what are you doing here? He said, man, I just came to enjoy myself, man. I said, what do you do? He said, I go to school, man. You know, I said, I'm in college. And I said, man, it takes, and I said to myself, I wish I could be him, his size, his stature, because he had balls. He, he just, he had something. I was looking at him. Being in this environment, little fragile looking white kid, man, and I'm, I'm 6'2 looking like um, the big bad wolf. And I'm looking at this kid like, wow, he's, he's, you know. So I got all the muscles, the big dick and all that. And this little kid, and I'm like, wow, man, I wish I could be him. Because he was honest. I wasn't. So I always term this in the beginning. I'm just gay for pay. I'm not, just that's it. So it was about four of us make that pack. So our women would drive us to the movie sets and uh, drop us off and wait for us to get done and we'll go home with our, with our women. You know, we were in relationships. The four dudes, you know, that was, you know, kind of formed a relationship with. I never looked at my movies. I never went to Boris. I didn't do the club scene. Where most of them was looking for that advertisement, looking to do, you know, the dancing and the escort. I didn't. I just did take my business. Went home, felt like shit, and smoked crap. Because I knew one day my family was going to see that it was more than books that I did, photo shoots. But by then, the crack happened. And I was tired of going to prison. And I found something that would keep my ass out of prison. And it kept me out of prison seven years doing movies. Steady income. Had just what I needed. Didn't have to rob, steal, borrow, beg, or nothing. I was able to take care of myself, man and do what I want to do my way. And um, I missed a lot of opportunities during that time too, because doors are opening, but I feel so bad, so hurt about, man, you know, I'm, I'm doing these gay movies and I have a, a woman, you know, I love women. But I'm doing them, I'm doing them, but it's hurt me. It, it's like a, on the movie set, I'm, I'm good. Off the movie set, I'm, I'm, I'm just something. It's like I'm living two lives, man. I'm, I'm arrogant and I'm flex. Sometimes I go into flex and don't turn them off. Sometimes I'm Eric and can't turn Eric out. And, you know, sometimes I got confused with the two. I forget sometimes because somebody recognized me somewhere. Hey, hey, man, I love you. I love you. Oh, thank you. You know, uh, people used to come on, visit me from London. It's been an hour, maybe two hours. No, two hours. Uh, New York flew me out. Just to, I, I had no idea because, like I said, I do my movie and I go home. That's it. Nothing else. Where everybody else is just out there enjoying themselves, having a good time. I was, I was uh, killing myself slightly with crack cocaine because of the guilt and shame. And one day, I think, uh, yeah, about six years into it, 60 movies, around six. I did about 10 a year. And I did, I did them with one, I was loyal to one company all those years. And I branched off a little bit, made more money. But I was more comfortable with the, you know, this one. This one. And uh, my little cousin happened to be in a adult bookstore and saw me and rang the alarm. I don't know what she said, but it was enough to have everybody call me like, man, you know, like I had, um, robbed a bank or something. I'm like, what did she say? Why did you, she, well, whatever, you know. So, I don't know what she said. I never asked her, but I know it was something that I think she put more on it than she should have. Because to me, I'm just supporting myself, supporting my habit. I'm staying out of trouble, I'm staying out of prison. Woo -woo. But most of, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just taking care of me. 
And that's the way I looked at it. You know, just taking care of me. I never saw myself as a superstar or somebody, but that's how everybody else was looking at me. I, I, I couldn't see it because I was lost in the sauce. I said my reality was still uh, South Central. So I'm going, I'm going to these nice homes, making a scene in Woodland Hills with the pool overlooking the mountain as it goes down. I'm at those kind of houses. And I'm just walking, you know, drinking water, going to the restroom. And, you know, I'm like, just, you know, I'm just like, wow, see the Hollywood sign right there. I'm like, God, this is incredible, you know. And then after the shoot, I'm back in South Central feeling like a piece of shit. Because I should be out there, not down here. As many movies as I made. I many people want to deal with me. So, the cat was out the bag. And um, everybody, man, just, just like the flood walls, you know, hey man, are you gay? Hey man. You know, and, and when I told them no, some didn't believe me. I didn't give a damn. I didn't care at that point because it was over, man. You know, the gig was up. And I think about a year after that, I stopped. I do no more. You know, because everybody was always looking at me a certain, a peculiar way after that. Nobody was tripping on the movies. I don't know what it was that she said, but it was something that just rang the alarm and everybody looked at me different from there on. You know, and um, I didn't care because I had the crack of solace, man. That was, my, that was my companion. I was okay as long as I had that, we were good. I didn't care what nobody thought, what nobody said, but I did. I did. And um, after the movies, I continued to smoke crack and not, not working in a, in a business. I had to go back to my old uh, ways. And that was um, nickel and diamond, Pan Am at the gas station. Um, still at the little 99 cent store, stuff like that. And um, went back in trouble. Went back into that business cycle real fast. And um, I remember going, I think I went to prison, yeah, 19 times. But I remember the last time. I remember the first time and the last time going to prison. I remember my first rehab and my last rehab center. But my last trip to prison, um, I was coming out of the store, $2.50 face cream. Face cream for a woman at 12. Try to stop me. Um, so now I'm making a story, built, and um, I continued on. And somebody just happened to be at the light watching as a little, in, uh, as a little altercation, as a uh, altercation that had uh, taken place. So I've been walking down the street, take my hat, toss it, get to the, hit the corner, take my little shirt off, toss it under the car, continue to walk, two face screens. All of a sudden, you hear this, I said, oh shit, I, I just knew. And, um, hey, they stopped, put your hands up. And I remember the judge, um, um, the puppy friend that told me, hey man, nine with 80. I said, for $2.50, I'm not taking that. That's seven. I said, how much is that? Nine with 80. That's seven years and one month. Man, I'm 43, I'll be 50 when I come home. Can't do it. I said, I'm willing to go no lower. And if you go to trial, you get 16 years. So, I thought about it. Mind you, I had my family here. My mom, my sister, my two nephews. And they were always talking to the uh, just uh, the public friend. I had no idea because I'm in there for five minutes. I'm, in, I'm already incarcerated. So first, first in, first out. <clears throat> but what happened was, my mother and the district uh, and the public defender interacting and her showing pictures of, of my grandfather, the first black police chief, of my uncle, military and all that kind of stuff. She showed them a different a different person than what was in writing. In writing was just a a long history of uh, petty thefts, crimes, stuff like that. Nickel and dime stuff. All drug related, all drug induced. Because I just had to have it. And um, I never forget the district attorney 
came to the, to the holding cells, he said, hey man, I've been prosecuting men for over 15 years. That's my job. Your mom and the puppy defender took my eyes off of your crimes because that's what I'm based on, what's written, and, and to see you as a, as a person. He said, I never came back here and talked to nobody. He said, I'm not going down on the nine years with 80. But what I would suggest is when you do, you take, do all the classes, get all you can out of there, and when you come home, don't look back. That's the best I can do, and I'm giving you two hours to set that or not, and that's it. And um, he left. I thought about it, I said, wow, that was interesting. Him, him coming up just to share that with me. He said, by the way, he played, um, he played the tape. And I'm walking down the street and he said, oh, he just took his shirt, oh, he took his hat off, yeah. Uh huh. Oh, he took his shirt, yeah, he just put it on here. Oh, we're following him, uh, yes, yes. He said, they're out there every time you go to court. Two people that you're hearing now, they're out there when they record them. Got witnesses. I don't want to give you the 16, I want to give you nine. But if you lose, I'll be the whole thing because I should have get. Uh, he said I started off with 16, but your mom, the, uh, puppy, uh, puppy fender, took my eyes off that paper, man, to see a human being. He said I ain't saw a face in a long time. You're the first one. I said, wow. And uh, I took it. I took this. Uh, I took the nine with him. Uh, went to prison. Took advantage of all the classes. Uh, Stayed in the library, uh, stayed in, uh, dropped out in ninth grade. That, that, wait a minute. 10th? 10th grade, yeah. I just disappeared after 10th grade. Not having a dad and all that stuff and being mis misled from the beginning and not really having a chance. So the misinformation, I was destined to end up prison. I was destined to end up on drugs. And I remember, I, 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 okay. Anyway, took advantage of the class. And I remember some men showing up at the prison. And we're talking, interacting. I'm a son got left uh, Portis uh, five years. I'm, I'm a son four years, three years. And can't wait to, man, man, uh, come on, you're going, we're going to see you. What? Yeah, we're going to see you. I think you guys are way off. Yeah, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna hook up. Okay. And I met five men in prison and we made a pact. So it was, we meet in the library and um, chop it up talk. And um, five went home, um, one went home, the next one, the next one. And it was me and my partner. He said, before he, he, he went, he paroled one month earlier. He said, hey man, I'm gonna leave a phone on for you to call. I need you to call me once a week until you parole. Call me on your parole. I know when you parole already, but call me once a week leading up to it. I said, okay. He said, I'm going to be at the train stop to get you. I said, yeah, okay, yeah, right. You know how many times I heard that? Been in prison, what, uh, 19 times? I hear all those kind of stories, man. Oh, I'm going to take this, I'm going to do that. I mean, get, please, yeah, right. I said, watch, guys, name be called to go home. And they'd be petrified, man, because they had no clue on where they were going to go, what they were going to do, because they weren't prepared and didn't have a plan. And I didn't see it until my last time, because I was doing all the things that I was supposed to be doing necessary to come into that, into that, um, oh, I forgot the word. But the seven years and one, seven years and one month, during that time, I got to see different people seeing what they were doing, what they were weren't doing. I didn't have to ask questions. I just watched. Okay, I'm not going to do that. I'll do this. And I didn't talk for two years. The first two years I was in prison. I remember I was talking to one guy about one of the classes. And the CEO walked by and said, hey, Portis. He said, that's the first time I heard you talking in a couple of years, man. I didn't even... It, it didn't even dawn on me, man, that I didn't talk the first two years. I just wanted to be left alone. Because I wasn't happy with the nine with 80. I, I, I always felt there was too much, but it just turned out to be a blessing in disguise. And um, I remember I had a GED teacher. 
She always, you know, she'll call me, come report it soon. She still stuck with me from a woman's perspective. I said, okay, thank you. Then the sponsors, all the, it was the women in prison who wanted to see the men um, do good. The men in prison, they didn't care about us because, you know, prison is prison. You know, it's for like losers. But I noticed the women running, uh, staying after work, um, um, volunteering for the, you know, for the, the go get the, the, the AA panel or whatever, the toast, whatever it was going on, the different classes. It was always women representatives, you know, that worked for the prison that stayed overtime after work from uh, 6 to 7, 30, hour and a half, hour, 45 minutes for a, a meeting, um, you know, whatever it was that was going, uh, they had, they had a AA, they had any Toastmasters, the Wharton Book Club, they had pre-release, and they had some, uh, some other stuff. And um, the women really influenced me. They really helped me see it from a different, a different uh, angle. Because chopping up with the fellas, it's, it's, it's the same old thing. You know, we're just talking to surface things. Oh, what you, oh man, yeah, I was just, you know, I have four women, this, this. just talking to the, 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 the um, talking, talk, shucking and jiving, bullshitting each other, lying. If I've never seen nothing, done nothing, but just gonna put it out there. They say, hey, OG, what you here for? I say, man, I was out there in the way. I was out there, um, nickel and diamond, man. I wasn't doing nothing, just in the way. And I said, God, son, I was just in the way. And when I admitted that, I felt the freedom. So year one go by, year two go by, year three go by. I'm still doing the classes, the library. Um, I implemented, I had to implement something into my program because all I had was my mother. She's getting older, she's on a fixed income. All I've been, I've been on, on and off a of crack. So I didn't have no woman, I just had the streets. All I had was, I had prison and homelessness from my love affair, my, my love hate relationship with crack. That's all he gave me was prison and homelessness. No alternatives, no house, no court, no woman, no job. That's all I had. That kind of relationship. And I loved it and I hated it. Couldn't live with it and couldn't live without it. So, I remember doing, just doing, doing it, doing the classes. I said, wait a minute, I don't braid hair. I don't write poems, I, don't, I can't draw portraits. I'm not washing no clothes, I'm not, you know. I said, I have to find my, my niche in here because my mom's getting older. She, she's the only one that's really looking out for me. And um, I start training. And I, within my first year, two hours a day, I had it where I was training seven days a week, different men. Train one two days, train another guy two days, and another three days. And my, my, you know, my, my schedule was full, so every day for two hours, you see me the first hour training somebody, then you see me the second hour by myself, because that was my time for me. And this went up for five and a half years straight. Let's run a modified program, a lockdown, I'm out there in the yard, and if it was raining, they didn't come, I was out there. I went out in the rain to sleep, it didn't matter. And um, I used to get referred to when I was you know, going to different, hey trainer, hey it's a trainer, it's a trainer. And it felt good, because I was doing something positive. You know, I was getting accolades and kudos for something good, even in a place like that, with its haters and the prison politics and the, the nonsense that goes on. Everybody that reached out to me were sincere and they meant it. I remember three years until my, my incarceration, I qualified for this re-entry program. So they sent me to a different prison. That, that didn't work out after a year and a half. So they said, would you like to go back to where you came from for the remainder of your sentence or somewhere new? I said, no, just send me back where I started. I ended up back at the place where I started. And I'm on the yard one day and my, my GED teacher, I didn't know at the time, but it said Portis, report to the guard station. I said, okay, so I'm training this guy. So I said, I'll be right back. And it was my GED instructor. She said, I heard you were back. She said, remember when I told you that I didn't want to just teach you guys I want to be a supervisor? 
Remember I told you when you guys go back to the dorm to study, whatever it is? She said, I was home on my laptop taking classes. Did she say, no, I have the, super job, the supervisor job now? She says, I'm not, she says, yeah, I have it. She said, I'm not, I'm not teaching no more. She said, well, I just wanted to see you. I said, welcome back, man. And uh, it, okay, this, a week before I went home, a guy showed up from Tustin, Orange County. And he's been showing up for years, and I've been there for years. You know, I've, I've done secretary, co-chair, and chairman at meetings, you know, because I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just involved. And I remember, I'm the secretary, and the guy that's leading me says, oh, by the way, uh, Portis is going home next week. Um, so you guys make sure that, you know, uh, you know say something or, or just hear him out, right? Mike looked, the speaker, he looked at me, and he started to cry. He choked up. I never thought in a million years that I would affect somebody like that just by being, I'm just like everybody else, seeing the blue, you know, the blue outfits and all that stuff. He cried because he was happy for me getting ready to parole. That was in there, don't give a fuck about me paroling. They can care less. He did. And it was, all, of, all the fellas looked at me, looked back at him. I couldn't believe it. So he talked and he started crying, man. He just, and I said, wow, wow, what, what a ride. Because everything was, everything was just, you know, put one foot in front of the other without even thinking, but just doing. And for the first time in 19 trips, I came home prepared and I came home with a plan. Okay, oh, I was the last one to leave out the five guys, the five men. Um, I parole, got down to Union Station, two tours were, my friend was there to get me. We go to Van Nuys, hometown buffet. The other three are there waiting. We meet, round table, all we can eat, in celebration of me coming home. So, my partner was in a, so we're living in a, uh, San Pedro. So he said, I'm gonna take you by your mom's house and then you come out there with me and we'll do our thing from there. So you won't be no burden on nobody. You've been gone a long time and all that kind of stuff. So you have to be kind of, you know, reintegrated with, you know, society and all that stuff. You know, I said, cool. So we're by my mom's house. He says, you know what, son? You don't mind if you don't go to the sober living, but you stay here and help me out for a while. I said, okay. So I went out to the car and told my partner, hey, she wants, um, he said, okay, you know, you're going to get your stuff off the car. And um, I got my little stuff in, went in, and um, got to be with my mother, man, after seven, seven and a half years. But what I saw reality was different than what I envisioned when, 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 when I was in prison, just thinking about, you know, what my mama looked like now. When I came home, she was old and she couldn't get around like she used to. And it shocked me so much to where I broke down. I used to go in the room and just cry. Regain composure and go back and deal with my mother in society with everything else that had to offer me, man. It wasn't easy. But I had friends that cured, one in particular cured enough about me to make sure that I was gonna be okay, that there's nothing that I can tell them, there's nothing, you know, and it went both ways. Being at home with my mother, I thought it'd be like it was before we left, but we changed, we both changed. And I remember sometimes she said, hey man, I'm gonna call your friend if you keep on doing this or doing that. He says, hey Eric, your mom says you're scaring her. She feels afraid, she feels fearful. Man, come on. But I didn't see that she, we changed, man. I thought it'd be like I imagined it, but in reality it wasn't. We have, we, you know, we have our little disagreements and stuff like that. And I wouldn't talk to her for two, three days, man. And I'm in one room, she's in another room. She had a two bedroom apartment. And um, 
She said, okay, man, son, I apologize, man, for whatever. If I did it, my bad, but we can't walk through here without saying anything to each other. I said, okay, mom, you know, just keep the drama down. But I was with her a year and a half. She's on section eight. So the people are coming through to check out the place. So I have to leave. But they kept noticing men's stuff, men things in, in the closet in the other room. Say, hey, man, come on. What's going on? Okay, my son is looking. They said, well, you can't have him here, you know, long. You have to, you know, he can stay two, three days, you know, whatever. I said, okay, mom, I'll go to a rehab. You know what? Let me back up. I was going to meetings. Let me back up. I paroled. The next day I got a, G, uh, uh, a membership at the 24 Fitness. I started going to uh, meetings. And a year into it, I met a girl. Beautiful. Puerto Rican and black. Body out this world. And she said she liked, she liked uh, uh, party favors. Now I told her, hey, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a program doing my thing. I've been home, you know, year. I got this much time accumulated. What do you mean party favors? Drugs. I'm like, okay, man, I ain't tripping on that. Been there, done that. So we hook up two weeks later. Now she's from New York. She's down here. She just got here. She's at, um, at the train station, right? So we talking. I said, what you doing all that luggage? And she explained to me, you know, just got here, New York. Port okay, get all that. She said, I need time to get situated. We'll hook up. I'll call you. She called me about two weeks later. Now, within that year, I got, uh, I got my driver's license. That was the first thing I did. And I got it at 50. First time I took the written test, I passed it. First time I took the driver's test, I passed it. Didn't know I had it in me. Never could imagine, never would fathom. And that opened me up to just think of sky's the limit, man. There's nothing I can't do if I put my mind to it. And I never thought like that, never, never. But I was gone long enough for my head to clear for me to do different things. And it just became, um, it became a rhythm. It just became a natural part of me to work on the streets, practicing the same, it was just natural. And within that year, I had a car and I was, from, from the driver license to buying a car, proper insurance, registration, all that. And um, to looking forward to moving out my mom's house. Now, I had some real good examples. I had good examples in prison by the women. The women were my mentors, because those were the only ones there that were willing to stay extra to help us men along through our years of being in that place. I had one mentor on the street, and he showed me through his actions. He told me his story, and how he wasn't, his wife didn't trust him. I watched him sober living, visit his wife, sleeping on a living room sofa to her city, because she wanted him there for a year, because he did something to her prior to going to prison, wasn't cool with, didn't trust him. I watched him, watch it, because we're dealing with each other maybe once, he's coming to my house once a week, and we're just dealing with each other in meetings. So I'm watching him all the time. He said, if you really want to know somebody, watch him, hear what they say. I said, okay. And within five months, he was back at home because he showed his wife that he was serious. And he taught me something, the same thing. And before you knew it, I was somewhere I'd never been before. I, I, was, I was in unknown territory and I loved it. I remember a relationship I was in with this woman. I think I was in three before I met her in my downfall. But the, the one before her, uh, she flew me up north to her place. And I'm like, what? When I get to her place, she has a chest full of nice things. Oh, these are for you. I just, 
Nike shoes, Cap. What? Uh, guess cologne. I spill. Nike shorts. Hat. She has a nice core, BMW. And um, she, had to, she holds this position in the hospital. Don't worry about nothing. She painted this picture. I'm like, thank you, God. Thank you for this compliment. This, this, um, um, I don't know what you call it, but she painted this picture and I believed it. And I was like, wow, man, it's like my dream's finally coming true. I feel like Todd Bridges from Different Strokes at 50. That was me. Not being adopted, but in other words, of course, being adopted, she had everything. Had nothing. Working towards some things. And I sat there the, one week, I um, flew back home. Flew back out there again for another week. Came back home. Now, towards Thanksgiving and Christmas, we had a two week thing. She said, miss you, can't wait. You wanna come out early? Sure, stay for two weeks, cool. Get up there and um, within two days, she brought, she said, let me talk to you, Eric. She said, there's three things, there's three red flags about you. You know, the work history, you know, the education thing, and um, no license. This is before I got my license. I had met her maybe the first month I was home. I got my license within seven months of me being home. She said those three things. I said, okay. She said, so I feel like um, I need more than what you have to offer. I said, I'm cool with that. She said, you know what, I called the airplane, but the tickets are too expensive. She said, but I take the liberty of calling the Amtrak and they have some seats available and the price is reasonable and they have a train leaving today. I said, I'm, I've only been here two days. I thought it was two weeks. No, no, uh, just, I called today and it's leaving at uh, you know, 4.30. I said, okay, I'll go ahead and get my things. And um, going back to the, to the train, man, she says, you're the first man I've met that didn't curse me out and want to jump on me for breaking up. She said, why, why you? I said, because you were honest with me. You told me the truth. That's all I ever wanted my whole life. I was just being misled and it just led me to these places and I've done these things and I was just destined for this, this, this future that had no, I had no control over. Victim of circumstance? No. I was an active participant in everything I did. I knew right from wrong, and I knew it was wrong for the things I've done. That the bottom line is what my, my, my partner told me. He said, Eric, you were dealt some, some cards early on that you chose not to play. Every time something happens, uh, you, you, you get your cards, it's just fold, you fold, you fold. And now at 50, you missed out on what you should have did in, in high school, college, for us the work thing, relationship thing. And we started in, in prison, me and this man, one on one. So he was, he was just sharing with me, sharing with me, he's telling me about him and, I'm, and vice versa. We're just going back and forth to where before I parole, we were, there, we were there at the same place for like three years, but we regained this, this trust. And he shared with me when I came home, he said, Eric, whatever you weren't able to do, in your 20s, 30s, and 40s because you were on crack, prison, and homeless, you can do it at 50, but take your time. He says, think of two things you want to do in your 20s, that you wanted to do in your 20s. Think of two things you want to do in your 30s. You have opportunity, and think of two things that mean something to you that you want to do. You can do them too. He said, just don't be in a rush. And um, I'll never forget that. And he's still instrumental, you know. Um, call me and check up on me because five of us came home. One fell, another one fell, and I fell, another one fell. He's the only one left. He's the only one hanging in there. I'll go to meetings, I do my thing, I, you know, I do things, but. We just don't have that kind of relationship that we did. You know, it's not five no more. 
it's only one. But it's one thing he does is call me. And if he doesn't have the answer to something, he'll call somebody else and get it. Eric, give me a minute. Let me, let me see if somebody, if so-and-so might know what you need or what you're talking about. He'll call me back, but hey man, um, ask for, uh, take this number down, ask for so-and-so. You good? Okay. Nobody never did that for me, not in my immediate family. He's the only one that's showing me things that, that I didn't know. You know, he's, even in prison, he's the, you know, he'll, 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 he'll show me through his experience of what it was to the first uh, 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 drive his driver's test, his, um, his first job, um, even in relationships with women. He's been with the same woman a long time. So I don't need to ask somebody that's not in a relationship about something I might be going through because he knows he's still in one. But he always painted the picture so I could see it of what it was like to be in junior high, emotionally and mentally, high school, four years of college. He, he, he showed me through his experience so I could see, it's like looking at a movie. I can't get it wrong, because I see it for what it is. So, I know what's real and what's not real. I know real friendship and fake friendship. I know real love and fake love. My role models weren't cool. So growing up, I didn't trust any man. I didn't want to be bothered with any man. And everything I did, I did, even with the movies, I didn't give a fuck if I was wrong. I was doing what I wanted to do. I didn't, have, I didn't care about no other man's approval validation. I didn't want nothing to do with no men. I didn't trust men, never did. And I said, whatever I do in life, I'm gonna do it on my own. All those trips to prison, I did it on my own. I didn't mess with nobody. I didn't get, I didn't do, I didn't gangbang or nothing. I said, please just leave me alone. Let me do my time and go home. I'll stay out of trouble. I'll stay out the way. Okay, you got that. And no matter how many times I hit my head against that wall, I was responsible for me and my actions only. It took me, it took me a while to get that. I was affecting other people, you know, especially my mom, which had to, because my, uh, my partner, she said, man, you're like a bill. You're just another bill to your mom. You might think it's, she's, you know, she, she's love, yeah, she's loving you. She's looking out for you once every three months for the package. But you're a bill. You're not an asset, you're a liability. Yeah, it's cool to have that love, that, the letters and all that stuff. But in reality, man, you're, you're hurting and not helping it because you're here instead of out there helping her. She's helping you. And when I was with her a year and a half, I got to help her. I got to do everything. Just, just hey, son, can you just go to the light bulb? Uh, it gave me a real pleasure, a real joy. Stand on that chair and just. Just to, I'm in the gym. I'm still in the gym seven days a week, but she said, son, would you, I'm going to start walking around the corner now because I see you do your thing all the time. So I walk around, we used to go just walk around the corner twice. I said, I tried to get in the gym, but no, nah, she's cool. She, everybody's not gym, you know, savvy. Don't, don't, don't really care that much, but she said, I just want to walk to show my appreciation. And she said, son, I'm so proud of you. All the times that we got into it and you left angry and you came back good. And I'll never forget when I messed up. Okay, so, okay, I, I got thrown off, but coming home from, um, from up north, two days instead of two weeks. I'm on the Amtrak and I'm feeling real, real sad, real bad. And I get a phone call, it's my friend. Oh man, how you doing up there? What's going on? You going to do two weeks? Oh man, I, I guess life is good. I guess you're gonna be moving up there soon. You won't be doing nothing down here no more. And I said, I'm on my way back home. And I ran it down to him. And he said, oh, okay. So okay, and that was it. But I learned my lesson. Give me the truth, man. Don't give me nothing at all. Come correct it. Don't come at all. You know, be real with me. That's all I need. All I ever needed was that. And it took me a long time to, to, to admit it to myself. That's all I've ever wanted. That's, that's it. So I never had it for me. I didn't know how to give it to me. I didn't know how to reciprocate it. But all I ever wanted. And 
for all the things that I missed in my 20, 30s, and 40s, I get to experience today through the people I come in contact with, through my experiences with my nephews. I still don't have no relationship with my brother. Don't want one. My strange father came back when I came home, said, I'm good, Pops, but thank you. I'll never ask you for nothing. And I mean it because it's too late. What were you, when I needed you, it's too late. I don't want no relationship. I just want to be in a position where I can be okay with me. Where I can be all right with the good, the bad, and the difficult of me. And today I set me, all of me, all of my experiences, man. Yeah, there's some things I'm not proud of. But hey, that's life. You live and you learn. So, um, I don't trip on the past. Uh, I don't trip on the future. I just try to stay in the moment. And a little bit about the moment is, I still do the gym. I love punk rock music. I'll always listen to it until the day I die. But with Spotify, I push Israel, R&B. I listen to it for an hour, get about three, four songs. I push Ethiopia. Listen to it about an hour, get about six songs. I push Pakistan. Listen to it two hours. Afghanistan, R&B. About six days, just a piece. Uh, uh, Spotify has given me the opportunity to travel all around the world through the music. I've never had my own place. I've always lived with women growing up from the forest since I was a teenager. I was the first one at the house at 15, mind you. But I've always lived with women. And if it worked, cool. If it didn't work, back with moms until that last trip to prison. And going back to her, it wasn't a hindrance because I, I didn't plan on going there. She asked me if I would stay. That's the only reason why I, uh, I stayed with my mom when I paroled. She asked me if I wouldn't mind. I didn't want to be no hindrance. No, I wanted to be a help. I wanted to be an asset. And um, I had my own place today. Um, 53 years old. It took three years to get to where I'm at. And this is just a stepping stone for me. Downtown Los Angeles in a small studio. But it's mine and I had the keys to it. It's clean. I have food. Uh, clean clothes. You know. In the gym, I go to meetings. A couple now. I don't go as much as I used to because I went there to just to, you know, get comfortable again with, 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 with just being home. But I'm past the meeting stage to where I'm just living. I want to live, man. I don't want to survive. I know how to survive. I, I, I want a life worth living. Uh, been in a few relationships. Last one I was in, didn't work. Um, but that's okay, because if there's one thing for sure that I know is, ain't nothing going on but the rent. And then comes the gym, and then the meeting, and then the whatever else that comes, you know. But I still visit my mom. Um, people still see me and, 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 and notice me from 20 years ago. I don't live that lifestyle no more. I'm not that person, but when, when I'm, <laughs> Man, when I'm coming from the gym and I'm at the bus stop, hey, and we talk, it just brings back, you know, hey, you know, this, this, this is my story, man. It's a part of my life, man. And I have some men tell me, you should have somebody write a book about you, tell your story. I never thought about it like that until recently because more people told me, so somebody needs to write a book. And the cool thing about it is I read a lot of autobiographies in prison. And the, a real good one was Richard Pryor. I remember reading his autobiography, and I remember sometimes at night I tossed and turned. I remember sometimes I couldn't sleep by something I read. I remember sometimes I cry. I remember sometimes I laugh. I said, wow, a book like that can evoke these kind of emotions in me. That's a damn good book. And then that one was Scar Tissue by Anthony Kiedis. I love this story. You know, and that goes back to the music. Red Hot Chili Peppers. I love this, those two. I read, I read his twice, Anthony Kiedis. Scar tissue. But his struggles with drugs and alcohol. It's a overcoming. You know, um, I'm still a work in progress, man. 
I'm not perfect, not by far, but I make sure at the end of the day, I keep my side of the street clean. You know, um, I want to be welcoming. I don't want to walk around with the scowl on my face with the anger and all that kind of stuff with my hands balled up because you can't get a damn thing like this, but you get a whole lot like this. So when I'm at the bus stop, as big as I am, I want my face to, to read, you know, um, um, welcome. And usually when people stand by me at the, we just talk. And I love a good conversation because everybody has the earbuds, the phones, and all that kind of stuff. And nobody's really, I told the lady at the, um, I went this morning to this place called the Hippie Chicken. Oh, excuse me, the Hippie Kitchen for, um, for lunch and um, had beans and some Ruger salad. So I'm behind this lady, we just start conversing. Find out she was an uh, instructor. I've never been an instructor, but I've talked about the gym and all that kind of stuff. She said, why don't you do it? I said, now nah, I'm good. 53 years old, I'm good. I just like to, this is just maintenance now for me. But I said, you know, I want to thank you lady for engaging me. I said, it gives me real pleasure to interact with you. Just like this, I said, thank you for making my day. Cause that's what I need today, just something like that. I don't care where it comes from, just that. That's enough for me to make it through today. Because nobody knows what I've been through, nobody knows what I'm going through. How would you know if you never asked? Now how would I know if I never asked you? Same question. So I'm mindful and I'm always paying attention to if I can ask that, how are you doing today? How are you, you need help? This. And that's, that's where I'm at. And um, man, this is, just, this is just the beginning. It's just the beginning for me. Thank you. Because I know, you know, there's some things about what I should have did back then that I can do now. Uh, they were doing dildos. They wanted to do one. I should have did it. Because now it, it's still poss it's a, poss a strong possibility that I can make all the money because a lot of, I didn't know people are still at 53. I'm, yeah, I'm still a man. Can't believe it. I ain't did nothing. To, I'm still the man. I, I can't fathom that. There's better ways to make money. Of, of course, of course. <laughs> I, I hear you. I hear you. But it's, it's just thinking like, wow, man, I, I never saw. I, I never, you know, it's just what it is. But that's a part of who I am because people are always telling me that part, a part I didn't want to look at, a part that I, you know, I, I didn't deny nothing. I just didn't, I didn't look at it. Now I have no choice but to look at it, because it is a part of me, because it's out there for the world to see. I better learn how to deal with it, because if I don't address it now, you know, I can't not. Yeah, you're I you're go going in the right direction. I don't want to be in, I don't want to go in, I don't want to be in denial about any part of me. I just have to accept all of me and be okay with that. Then I can be okay with everybody and the world around me. It'd be a beautiful place to live. Excellent. Thank you, Eric. Okay. It was amazing. <sighs> Thanks. <sighs>